All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna from the University of Glasgow, and I'm really excited to be here amongst people where I don't have to first explain DH before starting to explain my research. Uh, so a couple of logistical things right at the beginning, which is everyone's favorite way to start a presentation. Um, for anyone who prefers to kind of follow along with text, I've tried to create sort of a preemptive transcript for things that I'm going to try to say. Uh, and the link to that is at the bottom of the slide, and it will be at the bottom of every slide, so you don't need to panic and write it down now. Uh, and the other thing is, while I'm at the University of Glasgow, and this isn't unrelated to what I'm doing currently, um, I did complete this work while I was at the University of Alberta and supported by the amazing folks in the DH program there. So that said, I do want to start with something that's a little more similar to what I'm doing now, which is computing science education. So the computing curriculum for K-12 in Scotland is built around this ABC model of what it means to do computing. So it divides it into three subsections, A for application areas, so that's problem spaces, B for building blocks, so that's kind of the computational primitives you're using to build your solutions, and C for that creative construction, which is crucially the translation of human understandings of structure and process to machine representations of structure and process. And I find it's really useful to think of this as a translation, and it's crucially a lossy one. Like any natural language translation, it's subject to all sorts of adaptation, workarounds, and a slight change in tone and meaning. Now, um, this is not necessarily a new way to think about computing. Alan Perlis was thinking about computing, the, the, uh, the core of computing being the expression of structure and process way back in the 1960s. And because of this, Perlis was very against something that one of his contemporaries, Peter Elias, called frictionless computing. So the idea that we can give the computer this very complicated set of instructions and get out a result without any kind of human intervention in the middle of there. Now, because of this, um, this kind of model of computing was hiding the very principle of what um, uh, Perlis considered to be the core of computation, right? That, that expression of structure and process. He insisted that, to harken back to that diagram, you couldn't necessarily create a universal B that is going to address every A. There's always going to be some friction between those, and to hide that friction is to hide the thinking that goes into computation. Now, unfortunately, this frictionless model of computing is somewhat become the gold standard in ubiquitous computing and modern computing, especially when it comes to user interfaces. And this is a bit odd because user interfaces are, by definition, that site of the reconciliation of those human and computational logics, but they tend to privilege paradigms that hide exactly how that reconciliation is done. And it's been pointed out by various people, notably by Johanna Drucker, that this stands to be somewhat problematic in digital humanities when they're used um, as part of knowledge production. And this is for two reasons. So first, it's because they're hiding, that reconciliation that they're hiding is the very interpretation that is the basis of humanistic inquiry. And the second part of it is that uh, the, the reconciliation that is hidden is often performed by tools that are taken from a very different epistemological tradition that might not reconcile those in a way that is conducive to kind of humanistic inquiry and consistent with the values that the researcher had in mind when they first posed the question. So there's a, a kind of unconscious transformation of their research question um, that is not perhaps ideal. Now, there's a couple different ways of addressing this, right? Um, if we're going to think about these models as something that is not, uh, the, these interfaces as something that is not humanistic, it rather begs the question of what is, a, what is a humanistic interface? And after looking at different theories and instantiations of interfaces more oriented towards the humanities, I kind of extracted these three core shared characteristics of what makes a humanistic interface. So the first one is transparency. And I think there's a distinction to be made between what I've taken to calling eyeglasses transparency and skeleton watch transparency. So eyeglasses transparency is that sort of um, pretending it doesn't actually exist mediation that I've, that I've identified as somewhat problematic in the digital humanities. Now, skeleton watch transparency is the idea of exposing the underlying mechanisms. And I'm thinking that's what digital humanities interfaces should be working towards, right? If data is a construction that is partial in both senses of the term, we need to um, make it a point of bringing that to the forefront. Now, the second one is generativity. And at the core of this principle or this characteristic is the idea of entertaining a bidirectional relationship between the user and the interface. So the, w the tools that we use uh, influence the way that we think. And in a generative, in a generative interface, hopefully the user would be aware of this and be able, be able to enter in a, into a productive dialogue with the machine by leveraging the computational affordances to kind of um, create their research question in, in, in 
collaboration with the machine rather than having the machine alter their research questions without them necessarily being aware. Now, the interfaces that, that we create are inescapably have their own sort of rhetoric, and the, the paradigms that we use to, to, to construct them um, require the creation of categories and hierarchies. But if the user can be aware of those and also potentially have the possibility of um, altering and, and, and playing with them, they might be able to construct a narrative that is more uh, conducive to, to their own particular research narrative. The third one here is interpretability. So uh, if the existing paradigms, for all the, the, the existing paradigms might be problematic in digital humanities, they are still based on the limits of human cognition. Now, if digital humanities people want to introduce new paradigms that are based, and I'm borrowing, uh, as that are working towards, and I'm borrowing a phrase from Lauren Klein here, uh, on the idea of promoting sustained reflection rather than immediate insight, they still have to walk that line of interpretability. They still have to be understandable in some way. And there are a couple ways to go about this. One is exposing different levels of kind of um, uh, abstraction and also like granularity to cater to folks with different levels of technical self-efficacy. And the other one the way to go about it would be um, kind of abandoning the idea of universality for situatedness, right? So designing with using paradigms for the, uh, created by the communities for which the, the interfaces are intended. Now, one way to go about kind of addressing these concerns is what Johanna Drucker did. So kind of that additive model of adding extra visual cues, uh, extra visual channels uh, to express ideas like trajectory. But someone like uh, Anthony Mazur argues that what actually the reason that digital humanities interfaces don't reflect that epistemological tension is because we're hiding the very core of like the specificity of the computational medium. So that led me to wonder what we could potentially do with uh, a subtractive model, one that strips away those layers of abstraction to bring the computational underpinnings of these interfaces to the forefront. So that led me to the creation of my speculative kind of proof of concept interface called Clairon. And I'll explain the name in a minute, and now you probably understand why I'm in the room with all of you wonderful NLP people when I actually haven't done any NLP so far. Uh, so Clairon belongs to the class of natural language interfaces to databases, meaning you could write a, a, a question in plain language, in this case French, because I chose to make my life difficult, and then have it translated and, and, uh, into SQL and um, receive tabular res database results. Uh, Unlike all of the regular kind of approaches to this class of interfaces, however, Clairon is not making any effort to pretend this translation is in any way evident or easy. At every level, it is trying to expose how the computational processing is operating. Now, Clairon, uh, this is a proof of concept interface that's designed to be generalizable, but I am using data from the Comité Française Registers Project, which is looking at 18th century theater. Clairon was one of the most famous actresses of the 18th century, and kind of what was special about her is she had a very research-driven, and one might even say data-driven, approach to theater. So I thought it was a fitting tribute. Now, I'm not brave enough to have a live demo, so I'm going to show you a bit of a video and talk over it. So the core of Clairon is this kind of two-box structure that you might recognize from other natural language like translation interfaces. You can see if the, on a successful query, you've got the, the question to query mapping with the highlighting and the results there. Now, what's cool about Clairon is it actually doesn't make any effort to pretend it understands things that are too abstract. So here, if I ask for, like, what are, what, what's Molière's best play, it's going to say, no, I don't actually know what that is. Because that idea of best is, is not actually integrated into the database. And the idea here is to get people to think about what they actually mean, what they're assuming about what the machine can know, and be explicit. So if you ask for the most profitable play, it would have no problem. Now here you're seeing um, entity mapping. So obviously it's really hard to figure out which tokens match to which uh, entities in the database. So Voltaire appears a whole lot in like play names and also as an author. Uh, you'll see there there's a key substitution. That's because it's not trying to be not computational. It's being computational explicitly. Here is the uh, tree. Uh, structure, so it starts with a query tree and then it becomes an uh, expression tree. Here you'll see that each interaction is logged. You can accept, it can accept plain um, SQL queries that be either constructed from scratch or taken from the query logs like you just saw there. And uh, what it's showing here is that the user is given all of these things that they need to um, ex like, uh, construct those queries from scratch. So it's given full access to, to the tables and whatnot. Um, I'll brush over this really quickly. Uh, 
I was influenced in the design of Clairon of thinking about DH-specific concerns. So a lot of what we're encountering are very specific jargon, very specific relationships, and interfaces have different ways of dealing with this. Uh, I opted for kind of a lightweight configuration uh, that would allow you to specify custom parse rules to deal with, like, and we have seasons that need to be treated specifically as one token in, in Clairon. Uh, also to specify synonyms, so like you can't use a generic word, uh, like a, a resource like WordNet, because I'm talking about feu, and if you come to says data, that means casting. It has nothing to do with fire. Well, all the uh, So it allows you to specify those custom rules, and it, they can map to any sort of uh, database entity, so rows, columns, or even functions, as is shown there with that little calculator icon. Uh, join path inference is the other big uh, problematic thing for any natural language interface. So you have to figure out how to get all the tables that you had um, and join them all together. Uh, I went pretty root one with this, so the database is modeled as a graph. Um, the, it turns basically the problem of finding the join path into a, a mix of a uh, shortest path and a minimum spanning tree, which is a Steiner tree problem. So I'll brush over this because uh, validation wasn't necessarily my, my primary goal. So I did a little bit of comparison with the um, di like stri structures, SQL structures that different systems can handle um, as compared with Clairon. And obviously the biggest weakness with Clairon, uh, like any kind of rules-based system, which it, this is, it's not a neural-based system, is to, um, it's limited by the, the keywords that it can recognize. The biggest uh, kind of more abstract concern is it doesn't ever cover the process of datification, which is obviously a huge concern when it comes to transparency and, and those questions there. Finally, I want to wrap it up by coming back to education. So on a kind of basic level, it could be used as, the Clairon could be used as an educational tool with the, uh, it's built around glass box scaffolding, so showing how all of those, um, the, 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 the learning supports given work, allowing for that iterative loop um, with, the, with the queries to kind of slowly learn SQL. But more abstractly, I think it's really relevant to what we should be doing in DH education. So DH is about a mesh of not only kind of tools and, and methods, but more kind of abstractly of um, theories and epistemologies. And if, that, if DH people are going to kind of figure out a way of doing humanistic computing that's more aligned with humanistic values, um, that kind of meshing of epistemologies is necessarily going to happen at an abstract and procedural level, which is why I'm really interested in uh, Michael Mateus' idea of procedural literacy. Learning to read and write processes in terms of what they're doing computationally, yes, kind of relevant to computational thinking, but also in terms of rhetoric. So this approach to computation in DH, which is very focused on that C, very focused on procedures, uh, is what Clairon is trying to bring to the forefront and um, what I, what, the direction I'm hoping DH education can go. And I'm running headlong into my time limit and also my current research, so I will stop there. Thank you.